I hope that's mm -hmm. okay. So everybody will inf be informed anyway by Zoom automatically now. Good. <laughs> okay, amazing. Yeah, so hello, Michael. Hello. Um, thank you for joining. Hi. I, yeah, so I was just um, starting. I just suggested, as we're not so many, that we also just in introduce ourselves very briefly and then we can talk a little bit about the project and we really were hoping to also have a, an exchange with you um, as we also want to develop it further and to get a little bit of, yeah, to see what, what interests you or what you, you're intrigued by, what might be open questions. And I'm actually in Vienna, so for me this is really a brunch. For Nikolaus it's more of a nightcap, I suppose, <laughs> because <That's> he's <laughs> in Australia right now. Um, but we built up this exhibition together in in Tanri near Paris, and um, yeah, for it was really a collaboration project between I would say my philosopher part because I had this PhD in philosophy and Nicolaus as an artist researcher, rather than me as a curator or critic working with an artist. At least it was a way of working which I had never practiced in this intensity and in this kind of you know, really uh, putting on, on certain projects, at least also both being, you know, very creative and interactive and so on, um, rather than this caricature of the curator who comes into the studio and says, yeah, I like this, this, I want this, hang it there. <laughs> and that's it. So which is also for me much less interesting, of course. Yeah. Um, Nicolaus. <laughs> what's yeah, your... hello to everybody. Um, yeah, short int introduction of my person. I think um, <clears throat> like the last uh, years of my practice, I got more and more interested, I think, in this kind of collaborative approaches in developing um, projects together, thinking around the project less than just contributing um, a finished work yeah, to a group exhibition or um, yeah uh, and when Klaus approached me I he said like I can see in your work something in relation to Wittgenstein and I mean I had uh, read Wittgenstein um, a while ago um, and I was yeah I was fascinated by that linkage uh, created um, and so our shared interest kind of or kind of medium of also meet and and discuss things where then the later uh, work of Wittgenstein the philosophical investigations which I think we can also maybe um, uh, later address what kind of um, importance that also played I think in the in in the project and kind of meet also Ludwig Witt, Wittgenstein uh, through our very different approaches also. So that um, was kind of more than two years, I think we worked on it, like almost three years, um, meeting regularly, online, offline, in a park, also during Corona, uh, we kept on our like experimenting also with various forms of staying in dialogue yeah, or establishing a dialogue. Um, also using Zoom as a creative tool somehow of drawing things together, showing each other. Um, and often it was just like picking um, uh, a paragraph. But I think maybe I should stop here and let also <laughs> others uh, uh, introduce themselves so that we know a bit um, your interests also uh, by uh, logging in and then we continue. Yeah, thank you so much for being here on a, on a Sunday. We, we really appreciate it. And it's a real brunch, so feel free to drink and, <laughs> uh, and eat as well. I think um, it, it shouldn't be this very formal Zoom. There was also an idea in doing it that way. Yeah. Alison, maybe you, I know Leopold came in first. Let's do it by order of arrival this morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. H hello, Leopold. Uh, I'm, I'm born in Vienna and I'm sitting in Vienna. Uh, my professional background is in technology. I'm, I'm working on 
with and on big and small computers and uh, electronics and software since uh, centuries. And uh, I'm, I'm the founder of Open Land Lab, which is a makerspace uh, on the countryside, about uh, 150 kilometers uh, south from Vienna. And uh, I, I want to move there. And uh, I, I want to create uh, a, a new in innovation space uh, on, on the countryside and also bring together nature, architecture, and, and, and people from several disciplines. So also, of course, I, I think art is, is very uh, necessary. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, on contributions to the new uh, European Bauhaus. And there is a triangle uh, which says uh, it has to be sustainable. It, uh, it needs to be together. So in, in inclusion. And the third uh, pillar is uh, it has to be beautiful. And I, I would like to have discussions, especially with Nicolaus, about the, the, the beauty thing. So I think that's enough for now. <laughs> Thank you, Leopold. Yeah, interesting coming from technology perspective as well. Cool. Yeah, um, maybe uh, Alison, tell, uh, I think Nicolaus already knows you, but the others we don't. So I would be happy to learn a bit. Well, one of the reasons I'm very glad to be part of this is that I know Nicolas personally, but I have been in Australia, not ever seen his work in reality, and I'm always interested to know more about what he's doing and the processes that are going on in his head when he's making what to all extents and purposes to me look a lot like drawings. And just as a little thing, that I'm a curator and an art historian, but mostly nowadays to do with um, Asian art. So it's very different to be surrounded by so many Europeans. But um, I started off my curatorial life being the host curator for a drawing show at the um, Art Gallery of South Australia in Adelaide of um, drawings from the Albertina. So it was a sort of early, I don't know if you knew that Nicolas, but it was a very good experience for me. Anyway, a link to Vienna. That's me, glad to be here. Thank Amazing, you for thank you so much. Mm. The Asian, that's that's super interesting as well, of course, because the way of thinking, drawing. Anyway, so you want to bring Asia into it, I'd be very glad, <laughs> glad to contribute. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, hello, Michael. Thank you Hello, for good the camera. Hi. Hello, I'm very happy to be here and I'm grateful to Leopold who made me actually wake up in time. And I am not, have no prepared statement, but um, maybe give a little bit of context. I'm specialized in a kind of um, software package for doing mathematical computations and I use it for art and for research. And one of the more close interfaces uh, to maybe uh, make some contributions is that I enjoy conversations a lot. And um, these have been taking place mostly via Zoom or video during the last few years and uh, I am always looking for ways to do better in conversations and having a way to maybe leave some uh, breadcrumbs behind after conversations have ended and uh, so this uh, idea of doing um, a workshop like uh, interaction in the context of a gallery space. Uh, it's very interesting to me and I maybe I'm not able to use all the leads I hope to get here, but I'm very eager to learn from that and 
perhaps uh, in, include some of the context which I believe will shape our, our future. So thanks for having me here and I hope I can be at least a good witness of what uh, you are preparing to share with us. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, how to activate a gallery space is definitely a big question for, for us uh, too, I think, because I once talked to very, you know, successful artists who showed her work in documentas and so on and so forth. And she said something which, which moved me quite a bit where she said, you know, we do all this work, we put all this work into an exhibition and then it's put in the space and it's left there to die for four months. I was like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> that's the way she feels about that. And um, um, and of course, that's some, somewhat, sometimes we can feel like that. It's kind of a, a risk, you know, that, uh, that the gallery spaces become these relatively dead spaces, these spaces where you, yeah, where, where the works are disarmed as well, in a way, where they don't like work anymore. They, they stop working because they're framed and they seem so stable and and people don't feel compelled to like let the works do anything with them, let alone do something with the works. And so, yeah, so this, this different ways to try and activate the gallery is really important to us. And um, one of the, yeah, so this is a very different attempt to also do that, even though we're both not in the gallery, which is paradoxical, <laughs> of course. Yeah, and the last person who joined would be Yasmin. Hi, can you can you speak? And I see that you joined from the phone. We were just doing a little intro round. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Yasmin. I'm uh, from the Angewandte as well, and part of the RPL where Nicolas is also part. And I just spontaneously joined. I am only on the phone because I'm actually on a walk with my baby right now on oh. Sunday morning. That's why I can't also join with the video. I mean, I can say briefly no hello for a second, but it's, uh, yeah. And, hi, yes, me. Um, <laughs> hi. So I'm very happy that I managed to put him in the buggy and <laughs> that he's more or less calm so I can at least listen. Um, and yes, I was really interested in what you both will present because I know a bit about Nicolas' works. But of course, I know a lot about your collaborate, collaborative work because um, I followed Nicolas um, for, I, for a while now since we are in the RPL and talking about works. And so I was just curious and thought, okay, it's maybe a time where I can join because it's not quite difficult sometimes um, to have time for things like this. So I'm actually quite happy that I managed. And unfortunately, I didn't see your works in real yet, but um, through these online possibilities, sometimes it feels you are there in real. So I'm quite excited to listen to what is coming. And uh, I'm sorry if I maybe will drop out at some point. It's not due to that I don't find it interesting on, or don't want to follow, but it, it might happen that I just have to um, drop out from, from the Zoom at some point. So sorry for that already now. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. you love maybe also to the crows in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you heard the crows. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I'm in the park. <laughs> yeah. It brings in some nature. That's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but also to contextualize maybe for the others, like um, Yasmin is a dear colleague and, and artist friend of mine. And we work together at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, where we um, are in the steering committee of setting up like the performance lab which was missing for the uh, last, mm -hmm. yeah, last 20 ever. years, ever. I think, yeah, <laughs> yeah. since ever. <laughs> and I think the link to performance is interesting from my perspective, because um, also linking to what Michael said, you know, that this kind of a way of activating and bringing to kind of a liveness and that thinking is not something which only happens in the head, but ha happens actually um, is kind of an embodied practice happening with the with the whole body, uh, and so this this makes it, I think, um, especially interesting. I think also to create this linkage to to a performative uh, approach towards Wittgenstein. I see there is Claire, 
scanlon coming in so that's also a very nice surprise hi claire can you hear us hello um, hi <laughs> hi nicholas <clears throat> hey that's fantastic a bit earlier here in the uk so i'm, I'm sorry i'm late <laughs> No worries. It's a branch, you no know, worries. people can be late for branches. <laughs> drop in and yeah. drop out. Yeah. We were we were just doing we were just finishing the intro round and you just came after the last pe person spoke. So if you we would be super happy to to if you just introduce yourself as well quickly. Oh okay. At a <laughs> um jumping into the cold water. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, my name's Claire Scanlon, obviously, and um I know uh well I've known Nicholas. Um from my interest in his work for, for several years, but we sort of consolidated that interest recently in an interview piece for um, for um, a academic journal, um, the uh, Journal of Visual Art Practice, on the diagram in creative research. So we we had a very um, enjoyable exchange about his objects yet to become, in fact, um, series. Um, over the, the months of lockdown last year, or in fact the year before now. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm an artist and researcher, now a uh, retired teacher, <laughs> so much more time to um, enjoy my, my own, pursue my own research interests, let's say. Yeah. Amazing, super. Yeah, I saw that exchange actually came out, yeah. That's that's just after we had started our our exhibition, and as you as you probably have seen, objects yet to become is one series that is also present in the exhibition a little bit, and we were um, yeah trying to kind of extend it based on on the things we found in Wittgenstein. Yeah, super. Well, welcome all. Feel free to like get bread, coffee. I I'm making a point of also drinking green tea and and eating my my bread so feel free to do the same um i always switch off my microphone when i'm when i'm man munching but <laughs> uh, that that being said yeah feel free for to take this as a brunch yeah so what we thought i don't know if did some of you already see um some intro video of that we made or not if not um if not maybe we thought it would be interesting to like get also a sense of the space a little bit that uh, we could look at uh, a video together and then we can like focus on works maybe using also also pictures. Um, and we have this one video where we really walk into the space and um, and yes, give a short introduction also. Yeah, yeah, a little of a bit of the introduction. And so there is basically we choose to to contextualize the new Wittgenstein work, which Nicolas mentioned briefly before, really, we tried to anchor with paragraphs from Wittgenstein, because our worry was also a little bit Wittgenstein, a lot of people won't know, maybe people also get afraid. There's just an article that came out by a writer in art press, and she said, don't be scared when you hear Wittgenstein in the beginning of her article, because of course, a lot of people, especially if they're not from a German context or not from an intellectual philosophical context would be like, oh my God, like that's going to be like a super intellectual complicated exhibition where I'll feel like I don't know anything. And so in order to kind of um, make it easier, we thought it would be great to always have a paragraph that we start with. So people could basically read this paragraph and then look at the works in exchange and kind of, yeah, without having to know Wittgenstein. And uh, the beautiful thing about Wittgenstein's writing is, of course, this discontinuity, this way of writing in what he calls remarks, philosophical remarks, um, rather than essays. So each remarks has a certain degree of autonomy as well, even though what we did weren't really interpretations, it wasn't really about like, or interpretation depends on the term of interpretation. Maybe it was interpretation, but it was not a Wittgenstein analysis. Um, but really that's why the main, one of our main projects that we also show in this little intro video first is called philosophical deviations. So it's basically, Wittgenstein had investigation. The investigation, of course, had this strong research character, but we took the liberty to take his, his uh, work as inputs for creative thinking. And for me as a philosopher, Nicolaus contextualized a little bit his interest as an artist also in Wittgenstein. For me as a philosopher, it's also interesting to see 
how this work in, in, in drawings and in thinking it further can challenge the philosophy. Like for me, it's also a way to, to find a different way than the purely argumentative way to maybe even test philosophical thinking and see what are the moments where maybe it, it actually breaks down, especially when a philosopher uses a lot of images and thought experiments where you're like, well, yeah, we can try out what happens if we imagine a rod and then see how that reflects back on the text. So that was kind of the, beyond the artistic interest I had, was also there was also a hidden kind of philosophical interest where I'm like, ah, let's see what's the back effect on the philosophy and the reading of Wittgenstein of this work. So I'd, um, if you want, I just um, put the link in the, ch in the chat because like sharing uh, things over Zoom itself will just reduce the quality for everyone because we have the bandwidth problem. So um, I, I put this link in um, for you to watch. Um, and if someone has already seen it and doesn't want to see it, you can also stay in the Zoom. But yeah, so there's this possibility of, of watching this, this little uh, intro so you see what, what, what the space looks like and feels like. Is that, is that nine, okay with nine, nine minutes, yeah. Nine minutes. Is that okay with, with all of you? So we have a common ground. Because if not, we're just talking about a show without yes. actually having any idea of what it looks like. Okay, cool. Yeah, you see the, the link, the YouTube watch in the chat should be clickable. Ah, no, I clicked, I sent it in the waiting I haven't room. Said it's not a good idea because no one is in the waiting room right now. <laughs> Every... I haven't got it yet. Here we go. Ah, here it is. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Hello, welcome to uh, this little one. Walk through of our exhibition, um, if you could have more see. Claire, you're you're back, but you saw it you saw it before you said already. That's sweet. Yeah. Um, did you have any 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 thoughts also based on on the conversation you had before with with Nicolaus, or um, um, shall we wait for for everyone to return and yeah, as you prefer. Hmm. Yeah, I've had lots of thoughts. <laughs> And, and questions, but um, mostly, well, if we should wait, but I would say that um, I really enjoyed your introduction, Klaus. I thought it was, it made it really accessible, given that we're all so remote from the first-hand experience. So I thought it was really good. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, are there any drawings from Wittgenstein? You mean in our exhibition or? Uh, at all. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's interesting. I mean, in the little video, I I did show some excerpts from from his um, from from his manuscripts, and he did draw. I mean, mostly kind of mind mappy stuff, but sometimes objects and little scenes. So there is there is a, a kind of movement towards drawing. And also, of course, as he sometimes comments images, then he will sometimes draw 
a small image corresponding to that. And one of these images even became the basis of one of our works, um, which is the work with boxes, um, which we didn't show the video off yet. We, we didn't upload the video yet, but um, we can show you a, a picture as well later. So that was something that you found particularly interesting as well, uh, Nikolaus, right? This philosopher who draws and and this kind of relationship between writing and and the drawing and somehow a continuity between both, which you have I, when you write by hand easily, but you have very hardly, and which is interesting because kind of the tool when you write on on word, this doesn't happen because it's not there's no slip between drawing there's the mm. frontier is very strict so something is lost as well when you write i realized that when i was writing my phd that writing everything on word documents i lost this ability to slip to a drawing um, and then i moved back to white paper at least for the idea generation phase because the phd then has to be a text document but at least during the idea generation i found it very valuable yeah nicolas yeah, no, <clears throat> uh, based on my interest in drawing, I, I find exactly this kind of slip between the two practices really interesting. So sometimes you're searching for words and it might not come to your mind uh, or um, uh, you cannot, it's like sitting at the back of your tongue. So you, it, no, but then it's maybe easier to, to do a small scribble, yeah, um, and um, which allows you to to notate uh, your thought. So uh, as most of his writing is done in handwriting and then also machine writing where he then later annotated some of his um, uh, thoughts and did a lot of like drawing and connecting words again. So when you look at these kind of manuscripts, I think you really see that mind at work. And I think that was for me super exciting which I find such a pity that not these kind of manuscripts are published, but then in the end, I think, and as far as I heard or the story goes, like I think Russell was also more interested in kind of the words and uh, not the drawing. So the kind of the, the image had kind of a bad taste uh, in, in these days, I think in philosophy. Um, yeah, and I think we picked up on this um, kind of idea on commenting through drawing. So Klaus um, did mainly annotations and drawings uh, like directly in the text. So kind of like activating this kind of text uh, image relationship where I kind of more, yeah, uh, uh, deviated and kind of, as I said, like, try to draw the process of sensing my own thoughts yeah or kind of sensing what I'm thinking when I'm reading it and that became kind of a cycle of um, propelled my thoughts further and like let letting go and my I, I was missing a bit then sorry there was stuff going on on my computer that I didn't quite understand was coming um, one thing that's occurring to me as I watched your video and I said before that I was interested in Asian art, Asian art, Chinese painting or drawing or mark making is a process and the links between writing and image making are, are total and that's seen as a combined process of writing and image making. In fact, the artists are called literati, which implies, you know, they they were men, men of literature. And if you were an esteemed artist, you made marks in a meaningful way that related to the words that were there, but it was the process of doing it and the energy in that process of doing it that was what was appreciated by the audience. And I'm just thinking it's a parallel experience to what you were describing then. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. I'm sorry, yeah. I was a bit Latin. No, what no, 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 amazing. No, it's really um, interesting also this, this difficulty or what's the difficulty of slipping, right? So there's on the one hand, their practice like the one you're describing, where it's kind of part of the cultural practice to have a continuity between these ways of expression. 
and then there seem to just be one they're not separate at all ah, it's okay. the thought okay. process that's important yeah and the writing and the drawing is the result you know it's sort of like incidental in a way that's that's really interesting because i think in our kind of social <laughs> settings mostly as also nicolaus mentioned in philosophy i mean your production is text you know and like when you're doing drawing that can be illustration but it's not part of your philosophical production and for a long time in art if you were an artist your production as an artist was not writing i mean this changed in the 60s with conceptual art and so on but until for a very long time when you were doing art i mean there are writings by leonardo but they are not his art. His art is the drawings, the paintings, and so on. So we have this very strict, even social separation between practices, which in some cases, you know, uh, or in all cases, I think limits the possibility of, yeah, generating third, certain things which can only be either or can better be expressed in one form than the other, or can even be expressed only in a combination like the one you're evoking of two. And, um, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's, of course, something that this exhibition space allows us to experiment with. But I must admit, and just to give a little insight into the process, in the beginning, we thought that the series that you just discovered on the wall, the blue one, that I would also contribute drawings. And it turned out that it was too remote from my daily kind of, I, I, I couldn't, I did a few in the beginning, but they weren't consistent enough and I couldn't consistently, you know, have the practice of drawing like Nicolas to then like develop a corpus of drawing around these things. And so I, I myself kind of always fell back into this habit of the philosopher who at best does annotations. And in this case, there are a few pages that I annotated basically with like little images that come to mind as I read. And I mean, I have my, I have my real, initial uh, Wittgenstein reading book here and it has this kind of thing which is something that that Nicolaus also found interesting here's by the way a drawing by Wittgenstein so this so he does sometimes he does these kind of drawings also to answer to Leopold but then I kind of also did on the side these small drawings sometimes even in my memory I realized that I thought that there was a drawing of two boxers in Wittgenstein, but actually I realized that I had made the drawing of the two boxers on the side. So there was this kind of slip, but yeah, so that's 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 how it turned out. And uh, it, it turned out to be much more difficult to question, at least in me, my practice as a writer and, and like fully move to the side of the drawer. Yeah, Claire. Hi, yeah, I think this relationship, um, I think that's really interesting, Klaus, because um, what we know about Nicholas's practice is that he's developed a lexicon of mark making through his intensive research in his uh, drawing hypothesis thesis. Um, so I'm really interested in this relationship between, um, I guess, illustration, notation, and diagramming. And there's a kind of spectrum, if you like, of uh, evolution and development in, in um, I suppose, what you might call pictorial thinking or visual thinking, as I think Arnheim would refer it to. Um, so that was one of my questions, in, in fact, because I think um, you, in one of your videos, you say how the, um, the little, the dis discursive practice that you did together on the blackboards, that it wasn't illustrating. And I think you've made the case that it was philosophical deviations, that you weren't being, um, uh, it wasn't an analysis of Wittgenstein, but I was interested to sort of dig into this question of the relationship between illustration and notation and, and how it deviates, <laughs> how it differs from itself. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for also like this uh, conceptual precision uh, between like the, 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 the terms that you introduced, like illustration as distinct from mark making, as distinct from diagramming and as distinct from notation. Um, yeah, Nicolas, I, I know that you've uh, thought about these things a lot. Maybe you want to start? Yeah, I think where, where what we were um, seeing in the video is like this wall with a selection of this, like, uh, I don't know, 200 drawings we actually selected then in the exhibition and kind of 
that the whole layout was developed there and we were still working like till the last day so that was kind of this process of still kind of drawing on and on and and uh, including words and uh, so somehow also uh, um, my French is not that good so kind of Klaus also suggested then or like in the discussion to add words uh, in my diagrams yeah uh, so that was kind of a collaborative process um, and even some I think uh, uh, visual elements were drawn I, re I remember the fallen uh, uh, chess king you know we added Klaus uh, in that one drawing yeah so like this kind of dead king uh, and and things like this so these drawings kind of kept us like busy and coming together and further discuss uh, how we understood uh, some paragraphs uh, through our different practices but when it came to this kind of table constellations where we playing with Ludwig where we sit on a table and we have a blackboard and we start a conversation um, the medium was right between us and uh, it makes again a difference if you have both like a, a, a piece of chalk and some objects at hand and you start talking and kind of the medium literally is that blackboard which allows you to immediately also erase yeah and write over and wash something away um yeah as klaus is um uh, showing so these um traces of our thought process i i think they really also point to something also what Ellison uh, 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 brought in that kind of there was less this kind of um, distinction uh, like cultivated in Western thinking to between drawing and writing but I think there it was constantly like slipping between and words caused into kind of more pictorial elements and then I think also for me like maybe my background or interest also in materials came in so then I think suddenly there was a piece of wood or I don't know um, some clay was there so suddenly it, it was not only on a two-dimensional level but things you can touch and be they become haptic and it makes also a huge difference if you kind of externalize almost your thinking and substitute it and say like okay um this um, piece of clay, I don't know, that stands for the, the formability of something. And then the other can pick that up and form something out of that. So it kind of suddenly the language jumped on, um, on so many different levels and could kind of um, contaminate materials and materials could back contaminate uh, uh, your way of thinking. So um, I think really in this kind of, and the, these kind and it became very performative also because um yeah there is a gesture there is a way of putting things shifting things from a to b on the table and yeah it's like a, it becomes like a, a game um with um where the rules are constantly uh, redefined and and reorganized by the two players yeah, totally thank you yeah that's um really this kind of language game i mean which is a big idea from wittgenstein the language game and we kind of established a new not only language game uh unless you also think of the drawings as a language which you might um with these constellations and to 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 geek myself back into your conceptual distinctions because i'm still like intrigued between these uh these questions of notation versus illustration i think kind of the, the question is both like illustration and notation has a referential relationship to something so you're going to notate for instance movements in space and then there's a correspondence between a certain trait and a certain movement and in illustration you also have a sort of correspondence between a text and the movement but the illustration seems to me intuitively to be more of an endpoint of the process of correspondence where the notation is supposed to be reactivated and so you can use a notation to then do for instance a ballet again if you know how to read the notation and reactualize it so so in that sense 
I mean, maybe we, to a certain degree, and we, of course, didn't have this, like, constantly these conceptual distinctions as we worked, right? So everything is kind of very blurry, and now I can only retrospectively try to make sense of what we actually did. But in a way, there is certainly a notational aspect where you can reactivate based on, like, what you see here, for instance, which now is in French, because that's one of the tables we really did there. And as Nicolas said, we... We wanted to to make it approachable you know like we're already in france we're talking about um, an austrian philosopher among people who might not be familiar even with philosophy let alone with wittgenstein so we thought okay language should at least be they shouldn't be too lost by also having a foreign language so we tried to add uh, in, in one part a layer of french and in the other to even also work with french and here um, I mean there is I think a possibility to reactivate certain things and there is coming back to Alison as well of course a gestural element so when you look at this word trish for instance at the bottom right where it says trish t r i c h e um you see that there was something else and it was erased right so you still kind of the traces of the making become part of what happened and trish means uh, cheating so so we were thinking about operations of gaming and we made a, a game terra and we figured out that uh, there were legitimate operations and then there were illegitimate operations um and the, the kind of often there was a financial aim in cheating so we put the two euro sign and of course this little capsule from from a beer bottle um we found in the place and we're like ah how we replace the ball by the beer bottle cap which then becomes kind of referential people would maybe know this beer from you know where they are um and so this constantly changes as if the ball was changing according to what it's used for um and we were thinking about instruments of gaming and some are you know very contemporary and some are more traditional and one thing that i found interesting particularly also in this one is that there's some drawings that are made to be played. And this maybe connects to this question of notation. We often think of drawing as something to be looked at. But if you think of a game like this, you know, where you do the crosses, or when you think of the children's game where they jump, these are actually drawings to be played, not drawings to be looked at. Uh, and, and I found that very interesting also in terms of what that could do to art or for art of thinking drawings that you that you would play and then only later it came to me that actually Nikolaus's series that you uh, had the interview about Claire uh, or the dialogue about is actually drawings to be played they are drawings to be activated they're not like the end point where I where he illustrates something and then you're supposed to look at whatever his vision of the world like in traditional drawing where you're like ah oh, this is a Cezanne okay that's the way he wanted us to look at the you know whatever um, so a lot of traditional and Cezanne maybe is not the best example because he's already quite experimental, but a lot of like traditional ways of seeing drawing is like I'm showing you a depiction of the world. And and here we really have drawings that are about and uh, that are about being activated. And then there's a sudden a slip from Nicolaus's practice to child, child's play, because who makes drawings to be played? Mostly children, right? So adults don't make that many drawings to be played. Uh, as if, yeah. So anyway, I, I, I'm going to stop here. But like to, yeah. Maybe to to, to have some uh, further remarks. Uh, like children played. Like in the right corner, you see like this play. Where you would be able to jump. Yeah, like this one, two, three, four. So you actually you would jump from on one foot or two feet. You probably know from your childhood. Uh, and on the right side, there is a game played for two players with pencils. So you kind of make marks uh, and try to kind of almost shoot at each other. So that was kind of uh, played in between our uh, conversation. So all that are traces of, of that kind of discussion around that uh, one paragraph. Uh, and I think also in relation to Claire's distinction between illustration, notation, and diagramming, I think the aspect of that it can be activated or like that the drawing is in itself like an agent. Uh, um, I think for me, there's the moment where I would rather um, um, use the, the, the term 
diagramming, yeah, uh, of diagramming relations, but also that the, the this kind of table uh, constellation works as a diagram. Yeah, so maybe. Just wanted to, oh, okay, sorry, please, Alison, go ahead. No, 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 go. I just wanted to uh, give uh, you like a, uh, a list of concepts which are triggered when I watch you discussing this interactive level of diagram presentation. And the list include, would in, if I would go on, it would be too long, but the first few items on that list would be gravity versus electromagnetic and other charged forces interactions in a physical model where you have one level of theory and try to depict all the charges and how the charges relate and basically arrive like on a level of Feynman diagrams where you depict possible interactions between forces for uh, chromodynamics, for instance, via electrodynamics, and you have the uh, level of accessing what happens in the cloud, cloud, crowd intelligence of the observers versus the artificial intelligence of the machine, which records what we are discussing now and we learn for potentially centuries of from our visual expressions, which we share here among us, but also share with the machine, which will observe our interactions. And on one level, the traces you leave on the blackboard are indications of traces left in the machine, which will basically become part of our gases in the end and observe where we look and basically black out parts of what we didn't see when we were looking at the presentations because the machine knows where we have been looking and knows what have, has become part of our level of accessing what has been observable but was not observed by us. So I now I'm, I'm out again. It's just a level of what kind of affects me when I watch this. I learned a lot from it. I'm very grateful for you to share this and share your reaction. Thanks. Maybe, thank you, Michael. One should also say that um, um, what you see is like the traces on a blackboard, but what like this kind of practice comes from is like this a practice which I call translecture. So I we also video recorded it. So um, so then it's really the process of the thought in making, and one can see the gestures, the pauses, you know, because that is also so important that uh, there is like. Um, Often one has the idea also in, in relation to thinking that it's a straight line from A to B, but I think it's a very um, wind, windy or uh, road and often one goes forward and like 10 windy. steps windy, windy, windy uh, uh, road. So it goes forward and backward and erasure uh, is kind of as much important as I think like the, the steps forward. Uh, and I think all that kind of becomes recorded in, in when one traces these kind of movements between two people going into a conversation. Yeah. So just to add on that kind of liveness uh, uh, aspect, but also like the whole, let's say like the gestural element of, 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 of um, thinking. Mm. I mean, the, the, yeah, the beauty of, of drawing is also this kind of trace that it leaves the trace, It's not like a print, you know, if I have a print from a computer, I don't know what was written before, but on a drawing, especially on a blackboard, this kind of drawing, you actually see what was there before somewhat, and you know, ah, something changed, or we sometimes purposefully cross something out, so it keeps much more record, that's also something I like about drawing a record of what happened um yeah but claire wanted and and alison wanted to say something 
hear you. We can't hear you. You have to unmute again. Sorry. Um, I, I was only going to add um, a, another term, which was score, uh, which I think it is interesting that Nicholas refers to the trace and you've referred to the record. And, and then uh, is it Michael was talking about how the machine that we're leaving a trace on now in the recording. Um, and, and I suppose it's uh, Wittgenstein left his trace for us to rework. So we're, we're all following in various um, pathways, I guess you would call it, including the pathways that are left in the observer's brain or the, the audience's brain after they um, interpreted or read um, what's left, what you've left behind. So it's a, it's a complex web, <laughs> you might say. But if I can jump in, I think that's one of the beauties of all this is that the, the complexity and the thing that going back to what Nicholas, you just said, was about um, the winding road that this is. The thing that was occurring to me as I was listening to all this and, and looking at the work was about is there an ever an ending? You know, like is, is, the, is there something that's ever going to be complete? And I suspect there isn't. And that's just fine. But I also was thinking about the word infinite or finite, you know, like these things are, are, are fluid and amorphous and therefore have that energy within them that you're not quite in control of. And it's interesting thinking about the two of you working together on this, because that's quite a complex thing to do. And to come out of it still talking to each other is not always, <laughs> you know, it's not a, it's not an automatic. Um, it's it's a process that's um, I think it's really interesting. I don't know if you've got any comment on that, but in, infinity that's the, the thing that was occurring to me as I was listening. Yeah, I mean, sorry if I can jump in because that relates also to this what Nicolas said and which was fascinating for me working with him. I think you know maybe all kind of drawing practices can be somewhat infinite in the sense where someone can reactivate them, but some are less infinite than others, right? And some give you the feeling, okay, it's a done deal. Now look at it, and then you can have reactions, but yeah. you know, uh, you don't, you're not allowed to change it. I mean, it was the first time I was working with an artist who works like Nikolaus, whose drawings stay permeable or stay open to the world until the opening day and beyond. Yeah. Because even, you know, beyond if there's an idea, he might annotate it or he might even suggest that I do it, you know. And for me, this was like the first time it was nearly like, really? Like, I, I can try to touch your drawing? And he's like, no, write it. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> and so uh, and this openness is really part of, uh, of the rules of the game that he established for his drawing and this will to know now it's going to be exhibited in France. It was already printed in a book like the choreographic figures, which we didn't speak about, but which is this earlier work series that he has. It was already exhibited several times. It was printed in the book and now we're exhibiting it in France. And he and we're like, we should give the French audience some ways into these. And then the, there's a layer suddenly of French words that intervenes on that. And, and it will keep the trace of the places where it went, you know? And if it maybe is gonna be in Holland the next time, you will see it on the drawing, that it went through some place where people spoke Dutch. And, and so that's, that's also a will for this openness that, that I really appreciated in the practice and which made the exchange much more rich because mm -hmm. he, he, he didn't like want to finish it once and for all. And what I, I understand what you're interested in is this, openness to collaboration and this permeability of your work to be yeah touched by the world again and not just touch the world but also you know that the world leaves touches on the work it requires some courage on the part of both of you i think to open yourselves up up to this and to then to public scrutiny so well done I think okay. it's also maybe just shortly saying, I think that's my interest in, in uh, yeah, this artistic research. Yeah, but I think that the work is not like this kind of, as Klaus said, like kind of closed, but it's kind of disclosing somehow the world for me. So I can experiencing um, uh, the world through the work and 
it can open up me, but also like other people. Uh, and it becomes, yeah, really a tool of communication where the communication is again inscribed into the work. There is different types of infinity, actually. Yes. Uh, and there is one type of infinity which is still, in a way, closer to our normal understanding of infinity, which is just like the counting infinity, where you can go on and have laws about how counting works. And there is another type of infinity which is vastly bigger and this is somehow the ability to have a new kind of positional value and uh, try to look at uh, an object with this new additional dimension and that already already happens in the real numbers so it's not like you need to leave the numbers but it is more intuitive this difference between infinities if you have this ability of forking into other languages or maybe in a future world there will be a way to have a branching tree of potential modifications of art so like you you could uh, render a type of stage of this blackboard as it was when you visited Nigeria and then another then you go to another country like the United States and then another country may have an option of starting where Nigeria left off or the United States left off so we are entering a, a, a production reality where it is possible to have this branch out of creative interpretations. And what would be interesting if there is some kind of confluence, a type of merging together of different interpretations that some levels of consolidation become inevitable, like particularly a um, building with legal blocks, for instance, uh, on, or, or modern uh, digital associations of uh, such uh, superstructures in three dimensions, which can, can be built on the blackboard. And in the end, you realize, OK, if you have a two dimensional space, then it's natural to escape into 3D and build castles of imagination on top of the blackboard. And it basically pushes people back from that because they cannot even reach the blackboard anymore because the blackboard is kind of inaccessible with the overbuilt structures which came on it. And, it, and in the end, it becomes architecture. Be, spaces where, where, where from this blackboard, it turns into a license to build in a slum and the slum is eaten and digested by people which fork out buildings and streets and living accommodations and party venues from the edges of your graph. And you learn there is some, and the machine will learn, there is some types of social charge will, which become embodied by types of uh, interpretation and making that interpretation a performance in an actual machine which is accessible for the users wow thank you for this development into this speculative fiction science-based fiction i suppose <laughs> not science fiction but science-based fiction yeah there well i I'd, I'd love to respond to that if i'm not jumping in too quickly um I mean, I think if I understand something of what Michael was saying is, is there's a tension between what um, your source material, let's say the philosophical questions 
um, which are working on per, uh, perennial problems for humankind. Um, the question of death, for instance, and where um, a creative interpretation might take you, where it might expand to. Um, and that goes, uh, that goes further into the question of uh, algorithms and how they might um, narrow down that exploratory space. There's a question about how algorithmic thinking might create a situation of epistemicide because it shuts, it cuts off various avenues of, of exploration. Uh, but that aside, I suppose what I was interested in is, is it's very easy, isn't it, when you're riffing off each other in a kind of playful way to go somewhere completely other than the, the, the premises, if you like, of the philosophical problem. And I suppose my question is about how do you stay with the trouble? <laughs> um, to quote Donna Haraway, how do, you, how do you stay with those deep questions, which are obviously changing, but there are some that, are, that remain very present uh, for humankind, which is the, the question of um, extinction, I guess. <laughs> so how, how, do you, how do you maintain contact, if you like, with the, the perennial, the state, the trouble, if you, the thing that stimulates the thought in the first place, the problem, and where it might lead you to in the kind of creative investigation. You know, are you, are you fully open to, to that, uh, to the possibilities of going somewhere completely different, or do you have to pull back and stay, stay with the trouble? <laughs> Yeah, you were talking about this, and maybe again we can also look at an example at the same time. The engagement with this, with the question of of death. I mean, I th I think we staying with the trouble is uh, is like of course a great formulation, but yeah, we're we're maybe looking for trouble that Wittgenstein didn't even wasn't even aware of sometimes. So, so that's at least one thing, like we're finding the trouble beyond or besides sometimes next to what, what he did. And to a certain degree, I guess we, we give ourselves the freedom to, you know, we spoke about the windy path uh, to jump around the problems. I mean, Wittgenstein himself once said that his only natural way of thinking is to jump around the problems. And that's difficult for him to follow the line and maybe there's also some kind of doubt. I'll take it uh, down again for now. But there's some doubt in, in the kind of um, efficiency of a thinking that would like be strict and, and, and be goal directed and stay with the trouble in the sense where you, okay, this is the question, let's come back to the question. This is the question, let's come back to the question. Where Boto Strauss, for instance, this German writer, wrote a text that had kind of a deep impact on me, where, where he says that a lot of things are written so explicitly that you can't breathe anymore. And that you constantly have to say, that is right, and you can only nod, that is right. And you can never say, it opens up. And I think the kind of philosophical writing that I like to find at work in people like Paul Valéry, Joseph Joubert, especially in their remarks, or, or Wittgenstein, is a writing that that doesn't, you know, that takes the freedom to, to be jumpy. And also maybe for me, at least, it's also a space of freedom within this activity with Nikolaus. And we often spoke about how in our daily life, we hardly have this space carved out to focus deeply on an issue, but then also let it flow somehow. So, so maybe this flow state in a certain sense was for us intention with a kind of, okay, this is the philosophical inquiry, let's stay, uh, let's stay with this philosophical inquiry where we took the liberties to explore different things and then sometimes stay with something for a while and then, but then also move to, a, to another thought. And when we look at this, for instance, you can see different explorations. I mean, down here, we were, this talks about Wittgenstein, the, the initial paragraph is not from the, investigations but from the manuscripts where he talks about the way we represent death and he says we represent death as a skeleton so as if death was already dead 
And then he says, as dead as death. And he thinks about how we think about beauty and death. And he says, we often seem to think that there's an essence. And then in certain objects, this essence is more or less present. So the beautiful object has a bit of beauty, but the essence is beauty. And so, and here we then came into talking about, he also speaks in this paragraph about the mythologies hidden in our language, about ways to express dying on the one hand, which you see here. So in French, you have s'éteindre, which basically means to extinguish yourself. And it's, of course, a very different way to represent death than être arraché à la vie, which means to be torn out of life. And so we were trying to engage with these images and also what they what they evoked. And in another place, we were talking about ways death is often represented in images. And Nikolaus spoke about this way people have to represent the, the soul leaving the body under the form of a body, but somehow more evanescent. And he said that that image doesn't seem no right to me. Why would our soul look like our body still? And, and then kind of, then we might take it from there and think about how images are produced and how they influence our thinking. So how the images we have on paper or in comic books or in movies will then influence how we think about the thing happening in the real world and so on. So here you can see, or here he spoke about, this was more a personal story about his cat and the death of a cat and uh, and how he experienced this, this, this death and some kind of, some kind of reconciliation. So it's kind of very flowy and we, I must say, rather than in a strong sense, staying with the trouble, I guess we let it, we let it flow and allow ourselves this more jumpy, windy, windy thinking. I don't know, Nicolas, uh, maybe that's one way to stay with the trouble. I hope so. I mean, we are all talking, this whole table is talking about death, but it's not like, okay, what's the mythology hidden in language? That's the key, key point. And let's come back to death, to death, <laughs> to death. <laughs> like the death of the black hole it takes infinite time while you are being uh, uh, torn apart like falling into the black hole means that your feet or your head have a different velocity and basically that makes you grow longer and longer until you are just uh, divided in yourself but this takes infinite time. So the, the moment of pain when you are basically being drawn apart takes an eternity. It's like, uh, it's like an eternal hell while you are being digested by the black hole. And the black hole not only eats yourself, it also eats notions of space and time. So the jumpy reality of the quantum phenomenon and the Einsteinian reality of uh, space-time uh, energy commutability are basically the same tensor describing energy and space-time. They all meet in this moment of death in, of planets, stars, ourselves, interacting with a potentially rotating singularity of attraction. And on a way, this singularity is entering our culture right now because our interpretations get in competition from machines which basically represent a next level of evolution when use it when the universe becomes aware of itself more completely than an individual could ever hope to. But maybe our group mind of people interacting might still be, have a chance of uh, taking part in that. Maybe even at a certain point when having Muskian implants, which I mean, which enable high bandwidth communication between actors, not limited to words and gestures, but actually giving what I think about. And you can experience it from a moment. The problem being how can we keep ourselves apart from this hive mind of associations be it in a demonstrations of fanatic individuals or a big 
telegram community or social network modulated interaction where we face the problem what is our own coordinate system of uh, interacting with you in order for me to still feel like I have my own type of continuity of experience without it becoming part of a situation which is basically a brainwashing, a cooperative brainwashing of people agreeing on a fictitious reality. Whereas the counterpoint would be an art like art, especially addressing philosophy, which reconstructs a possibility of individuality and freedom and ability to navigate all the charges and aspirations of art and business and power and politics and all the troubles of being like death and sickness and uh, unfulfilled love or whatever are the real dramas which take precedence when you are not struggling to survive at the moment. Alison, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> this is totally in inappropriate thing to say, but I'm going to have to leave. It's 10.30 here in Melbourne and um, I have to go and do something. So, but thank you very, very much for tonight. Yeah, tonight or this morning. Thank you. And good luck with the, with the remain. How long is the show on for? One more day. No, it's two weeks and then two we weeks. will do. Good luck with the rest of it. Thank nice you, Alison, for joining. Call. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye. <clears throat> Maybe yeah. also to say um, for the for the finissage we are planning um, to do kind of a hybrid performance. Me being in Down Under and Klaus in Paris, and um, we will kind of find a way of communicating and also like doing one of these kind of. Um, table constellations live so that is kind of a, a an extra new step in our form of uh, deviating uh, and playing with with Ludwig Wittgenstein's thoughts but we are planning that there should also be like a kind of moment that people can uh, watch what is happening there because the least of you will be able to be there so um yeah we will keep you posted on on which medium we will use for this kind of streaming the activity there um yeah one one thing of course yeah just to extend on that no 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 yeah yeah, uh, I, yeah. go ahead sorry no I, I i like coming back to to what was said yeah um, ah, so let me just maybe, uh, extend briefly <laughs> exactly. on exactly yeah, because um, of course, like what's interesting is not only the life, but I'm as I'm going to be there, I hope to kind of uh, augment this, um, this leakiness of what we do and also bring in the people who will be in the space so that they can actually kind of take part in the game as well. So it's not just the two of us in this case, but people can actually react and, and suggest uh, ideas and interactions. So that's that's why it seems important also to to have one person who's there, so we can kind of bring in other minds as well into this playing games with Ludwig. Yeah, mm, but, yeah, it's our experiment here yeah, in kind of bringing it on a on a next level. Also, that was the idea for the for the finissage to 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 make this kind of almost like private activity public. Yeah. Uh, as we have done it in the exhibition, showing the remains and showing videos of us doing it, but like really experimenting what is kind of when there is a community present and kind of uh, things with us, so to say, uh, around and uh, around one paragraph and kind of follows that process. Yeah. Uh, and kind of uh, is invited to join, join the game. Uh, which for me is uh, like coming back to Claire's uh, um, notion of staying with the trouble is, is also what Klaus said maybe to, uh, and also in reference to what uh, Michael said, uh, is kind of to 
to allow also kind of the the paradoxical to 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 turn up and that kind of uh, all those um, Wittgenstein's approach in his uh, earlier work was so much more related to kind of uh, tracing also a way of logic. Yeah? And I think like when he got older, he realized that kind of the, maybe the unlogic or paradoxical is as much as important for, for processes of, of, of rendering something plausible for oneself. Like also what I talked about is forward and backward movement in in kind of um, searching for sense, yeah, or what is what is sense as a as a as something which is also not stable forever, but kind of a precarious being, uh, which uh, has to be uh, uh, activated and has to be lived and has to be somehow dealt with uh, I think through this um, almost like a choreography or dance of, of and that's what comes then in I think this idea of Denkbewegungen and movements of thinking to trace these kind of patterns of moving and kind of sent by the around the subject but at the same time also uh, kind of in a self-reflexive way tracing what happens with oneself so kind of we had that uh, as Klaus and me were discussing and sometimes then we said like, ah, it's so interesting that in spoken language, when you speak out and read aloud one of the paragraphs and it's so different than how it is in German or in English or in French. And there's so many different kind of associations suddenly triggered almost like a chord of, a, of an instrument. Yeah. And suddenly totally different uh, uh, chambers open up, echo chambers, uh, and to, to allow suddenly to kind of, uh, um, kind of get in touch with this more, all these kind of subconscious uh, um, um, realms, which are constantly informing our ways of, of making sense. Yeah? Uh, childhood memories suddenly popped up and uh, I don't know, uh, rem uh, memories of smell and all kind of very intuitive elements, which you would like not think, ah, this is part of kind of a, of a, of a thought process, but all this is kind of, I think, very much embedded in our, in our, um, in our bodies, which are, uh, yeah, the source of, of our thoughts. It's like entanglement in a way, like you have some situations which cannot be uh, reproduced as a product of simple statements or assumptions or starting points be because the participating systems involve some necessary uh, combinations of events when you test one of them you get two results like uh, you have the situation where you have entangled reactions depending on the participants and if the participants happen to have a connection in this entanglement space then a jump by one of the participants results in an immediate jump of by the other participant, this, which triggers a situation which was implicit before, but could not be anticipated from the previous cause of interactions because they have been entangled in a different way. And still both of the persons, when they experience, they both know. So, so it is they, when one of the persons uh, experiences this, it kind of can give a empathic connection and networking, which is a high bandwidth connection, even if we are still bound in space and time and the traditional coordinates of physics, but there is the big bang potential which is basically this idea that space and time are usually the coordinates to describe blackboards, but occasionally 
when you draw something on the blackboard, which has the special capacity of trigger uh, an association of the participants, that can make up a new world. Absolutely, so yeah. This, this, and this new world is a different kind of blackboard then. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And that, that makes a big difference if you, you think together. I think if you use it as a collaborative uh, field of communication and I think, yeah, as you said, like empathy, but also affect all that kind of starts to, to start to play. Claire, you wanted to comment. You have to turn yourself. Um, it's, it's a sort of a side, but I, I just thought it, um, how it's quite <coughs> I learned recently about the um, idea of uh, appoggiatura in music. Um, and Nicholas, you were talking about that idea of thought process leaning forward and backwards. And um, in fact, it was a, a lecture by Leonard Bernstein talking about Mahler and how uh, in a, uh, and I think it's related to what Michael was talking about in quantum entanglement, this idea that the, the root note is missing in the triad and it creates this sense of ambiguity. So a poggiatura is this term where you play a note and actually it leans forward, it's anticipatory towards a sensation or, or but in fact, it's, it's leaning towards an absence in a sense because the root note is missing. Um, and it explains this sense of ambiguity that we, that we experience in music, which, which was fascinating. So um, I just thought it reframes the, the kind of experience that um, Michael is talking about in relation to quantum entanglement in terms of, uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, our very human um, interest in music as well. Yeah, it's interesting how our different knowledge bases also kind of leak into each other right now in this conversation. Um, but yeah, that's happening and how we can kind of try to bring together these different ways of describing similar phenomena and, and see what 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 I can relate to what Claire said because like in this trans lecture practice which I'm doing since 10 years, I had many moments of this kind of apertura leaning forwards uh, that um doing kind of a translation process of somebody speaking whilst kind of following the thought press of another person and trying to diagram them and sometimes i anticipated stuff i couldn't have known so it kind of had this kind of magic moment that those people who thought i was accompanying and and diagramming said like what happened here uh you formulated something which was later in my text or later in my thought but somehow it kind of leaned forward so um um in that sense uh uh that might be uh an approval for that uh, thinking is not ha happening happening on a so like on a linear time level, but there is a constant um, forward and backward jumping also kind of uh, on it in a temporal sense. There is a notion which formalizes this backward forward compatibility of transformations which I recently encountered. So I'm not an expert on it, but, uh, but maybe if you encounter something called the Chu space, this has uh, uh, some relations to Wittgenstein as well, because he had uh, uh, in, in the Tractatus uh, combinatorical uh, um, relations, which he describes as a context of invest contexts of investigations of ways to structure communications or conversations, and this involves a notion of different ways to create coordinates for, for, for spaces. So there is this idea that you have a, a way of transforming these coordinate spaces in a way that, uh, that observing it in a, in a way with time or against uh, in, in a reward, reverse time mode 
that these become natural, uh, naturally compatible. And this convergence is very similar to matter and antimatter, which uh, in, in, in Feynman diagrams, you can basically turn around the diagram and describe something different, but it's still consistent. And this type of uh, turning around the direction of conversations or, or ways to think about conversation is inevitable if you have memory, because then you, you basically have to keep apart the natural order of events and the anticipated order of events and the remembered order of events. And these become like a triangle of interpretation of time and potentially there is this confluence, which I think is the key point, which it because it gives the collapse of the possibility in the in, in, in the actuality. Thank you, Michael. You're you're bringing in a lot of notions that I that I'm not very familiar with. So like like Leopold, I'll also have to do some follow-up research on on many of the things that have been said. Yeah, I I don't know. We we've been together for one and one hour and uh, forty minutes more or less. Maybe for today we we can start the other parts of our days if you if you're okay with it. And um, I was just suggesting, as Leopold asked, if we could also share the the video that if you're okay, we might even put it on the figures of thinking um, channel that we try to use for this project. Claire, would that be okay with you too? Yeah, um, definitely. Okay, cool. So we'll also ask them. Okay, super. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's nice. And um, maybe we'll be able to organize um, something else like this during the week because we're also thinking that some colleagues at the Angevante might be interested so if if that happens we'll we'll keep you posted because in the end like the conversation was so organic that we didn't even like go to through too many works there are already so many general kind of questions that we could talk about um, but there's obviously so much still in these different works and different aspects. And Claire, you had this whole long conversation about just one project, so you know how dense and and deep these these conversations can be. It's published, by the way, for Michael and Leopold as well. You can you can find it. Maybe you can also say the reference briefly for your long long conversation. Um, it's in the journal of Visual Art Practice, and it is um, called. Um, oh, find it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I if, was, if you I'll, I'll if you agree, uh, <laughs> if you agree, Claire, I think I still have some uh, um, links I could send, so I could send the, to 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 X for access for Leopold and Michael uh, yes, and Jasmine. So that they can also read our conversation, I would, would send them maybe to Klaus because Klaus, you know how to to reach Michael, I guess. Um, contact via via no, email. Otherwise, I just Michael, saw it. I just saw it you, in the chat. His question. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or Michael, you can give us your email address, and I can send you. Yes. To... Uh, Leopold is my. Uh, oh my... yeah, you are. You're, I sent it to Leopold and he will we, we, we are entangled, <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> <you're from>? okay. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, so, thanks again for, for joining. It was a real pleasure. Yeah. It's so nice to like not to, to, to even get further out of our, you know, mm. you know and, and to have this occasion to, to exchange with more people and have new thoughts come in. And we hope to continue the project. There's a book publication being planned. And so... Yeah, to, it's, it's interesting to see different perspectives as well on how we might do things and based on this seriality as well and the question of temporality, maybe there could be a moment where we have these temporalities of a table, Nikolaus, for instance, mm. where we different layers develop. And so, yeah, so it's, it's great to, to use this input as well. Leopold. Uh, I would like to add an idea for the hybrid performances. Uh, may, maybe you know the collaboration tool Milo. Uh, 
of of course it's not not the same like the the, the haptic table but uh I think it's a really great tool. They are improving it uh, all, all the time. And it's an in, in infinitive uh, table where you can draw, where you can can work uh, with, with cut and paste. And uh, I, I, I think you, you should look on it and maybe you mm -hmm. can combine it with, with your physical performance. Okay, so is that M-A-I-R-O? Uh, My Myro. Uh, mm -hmm. I... Miro. Mi Miro, mm -hmm. yes. Ah, like like the like the artist Miro. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I will check that out. We will look into it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's 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 free for for free setups. So okay. We could use one of, of them for our first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I put the, the link into the chat. Oh, perfect, yeah. Okay. Great. Amazing. Okay, have a great day, everybody. Again, thanks for, for joining. So and good to see you. Thank yes. you. It was great. <laughs> Ciao. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.